No. Chomsky's work did in the 50s to show that this was insufficient for human life. Oh, oh, okay. yeah. from a linguistic point of view, right. And that's, that's yeah, actually, th th this bullseye I showed you the other day, you know, uh, finite state machines and then context for grammars and then Turing machines, uh, that more or less is called the Chomsky hierarchy, which he must have done in the mid 50s. Yeah. Brian. So I, I have a, uh, just a word question. Yeah. I'm wondering, maybe you'll notice, the, the term computation, did it mean the same thing before computers? You know, or rather, I wonder where the term came from, uh, or if it sort of originated around the time we started building machines and things sort of thing. I don't know the answer. I mean, it's a good question, the actual origin of the word and how it was used. My sense is that computation was used in the same way we think of it now, long before computers were used. Uh, when Alan Turing tried to abstract away you know, what we meant by computation, it was the first attempt to describe it rigorously. We all had a notion that there was a difference between thinking and logical kind of argument and brute force computation. So he abstracted away all the issues and said, OK, here's what we mean by computation. You need to come up with something like this. This is a computation. Anything else that you can't describe this way, that's too vague. That's not computation. So I think, in some sense, the word got a rigorous meaning only in the 30s and 40s of the 20th century. And before that, it was, it was left vague. Yes, he definitely used that word. Yes, yes, it's in the title of his paper. Um, I forget the name. The, the paper's in German, so I don't. Not in German. Um, um, I forget the name of the paper. Um, it's in English. Ooh. <laughs> Ask Patrick Winston that when he comes. That's a really good question. It's um, there's a lot of different camps in AI, and a lot of different camps outside AI. And, uh, and there you're going to get into real verbal battles, because you're getting into philosophy. At least here, we can always be grounded in something very specific. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's a big question that I really could, like, cement one end of it. Yeah, well, this reminds people a little bit of neural nets, you know, this idea of modeling you know, the 10 to the ninth neurons in your brain by by inputs and outputs and just getting enough things like that together and watching them go and feeding inputs in and, and having it, you know, build. People have tried experiments like that and get some interesting results, but, uh, but nobody knows how the brain works at all. Don't let anybody tell you they do. <laughs> they don't really. I mean, they, they got a, you know, they got a little bit. You know, if you cut out this part, this behavior happens. But the next step, therefore, you know, we, Imagine there's this mechanism. Nobody has any idea what the mechanism is of anything, as far as I know. It's a very interesting problem, and it's great to work on. But if you want to spend your whole life working on a good problem and not necessarily come up with an answer, that's the place to be. It's a hard place. But Patrick Winston will come talk about this in a few weeks, and he will, he will give you the state of the art and some really good perspective. He, he's very good on this. So I'm going to talk this through with you for a second. How do we make a machine that accepts the reverse? I mean, this machine goes through forward, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and we accept. If we want to accept things in the reverse order, and we want to kind of use this machine as our template, well, now we start the string on the left side, but the reverse one, we're going to start it on, in some sense, the right side, right? So the first symbol we're going to look at are the symbols that are at the end of these strings. Where are those symbols? Where could they be? You might end up here, if you accept. You might end up here, if you accept. Or you might end up, oh, that's it, two places. That means if you want to accept the reverse of these strings, you're going to need to be able to start either here or here, start at the end, and work your way backwards, and where do you have to end up? You got to end up where this machine started. You got to end up back at the beginning. So the new machine is basically going to run this machine in reverse. We're going to take all the arrows and turn them backwards. In addition, we're going to allow us to start at either of the final places where we could end before, and we're going to insist that if we accept we only accept strings that end up where we started in the original machine. 
So our new final state becomes the initial state. A new initial state needs to be both of these. And all the arrows need to reverse. And that machine will mimic exactly what we mean. We mean to be able to start at a final state, go back along the arrows in the opposite direction, and end up in the initial state. When we do this, when we do surgery on this machine to make this happen, it's not going to look like a deterministic machine anymore. It's going to look weird. And we have to interpret it. It's going to end up being a non-deterministic machine. And since we know how to convert those to deterministic machines, we'll be able to convert it back. So that's where we are right now. It's a relatively complicated idea. So let me stop for a second for questions, and then we'll actually do it. And that might help you ask some more questions. Yeah, I Jeff. Guess, isn't a kind of trivial semantic solution to this reverse thing? Um, like we just use the same machine, it's just in our mind's eye we're reading right to left instead of left to right? Yes, but then technically, how do we actually come up with a new machine that's going to do that? Because it's possible that, that, that semantically it's true, it seems kind of straightforward just to go reverse on this machine, but this machine's got two places it can end. That's the reason I put the extra final state in, because I wanted you to realize that it could have more than one place it can end, and then reversing it needs to be able to reverse from either here or here. But a real finite state machine has one start state. Now we're going to have two start states. That's not allowed. Maybe having two start states gives us extra power. It doesn't, but that's what we have to make sure of. So you're right, it is a semantic thing, but we have to carefully make sure that having these two start states, which result in the old two finish final states, that that doesn't give us any problems. Does that make sense? Doug, okay? Mm -hmm. Kevin. Doesn't this machine already sort of have two start states? I mean, just in the sense that, you know, you, you haven't drawn an arrow into it, but the the circle on the very far right, you could start there just as easily. Yeah, that's true, because these happen to be equivalent. But that's 100% true. But, but technically, I could have just come up with a machine that has three completely distinct final states. And the start state might not have been any of them. The start state doesn't have to be one of the final states. So you're right, but, but I could have come up maybe with a better example where, where that objection wouldn't hold. That's a good point. Other questions? You guys want to see? Should we go ahead and do it? Let's go ahead and do it. Let's make the new machine. We'll do it over here on this side. We need a new start state. But you're only allowed one start state. So here it is. It's called start. But you want to be able to start either here or here when you're going backwards. Because these are the places where you ended in this machine. So how do you start either here or here? Start here or here. I'm just going to make E's, Jesus, <laughs> epsilons. On the empty string, without looking at a symbol, you decide whether to go here or here. Okay, And that makes sense because you might end either here or here in this machine. And if you want to accept anything that's the reverse, you've got to be able to handle strings that ended here. Then you would start in this one. And if strings ended here, you'd start in this one and you work your way back. So this way, you handle all possibilities. If it ended here, you'll reverse it by going to here at the beginning. If it ended here, you'll reverse it by going here at the beginning. So we've got a choice. So Sharon, you asked before whether epsilons are ors. In this context, they're completely ors. The epsilons are used just to say you can start either here or here without looking at any symbol. And now we're going to reverse all the arrows. So what happens to that? Loops reverse to themselves, right? So that stays here. And this goes this way. And this goes, correct me if I make any mistakes here. Did I get them all? What about this? Look at this interesting thing. Remember in graph theory, we called this a, uh, its own strongly connected component. It's got no connection to the start state. There's no reason to draw this in. I'm drawing it in just to show you that technically, you really do do it, 